الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد Brothers and sisters, inshallah, we only have about 25 minutes to a half hour. Uh, the, the topic of teenagers in Islam is extremely important. And I think I would be remiss if I didn't take it in the general sense and let you uh, arrive at the, the meat of the topic in a specific sense. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He tells us in his noble Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Oh, you who believe, save yourselves and your families from a fire. That's what? A fire that's fuel is men and stones. And the reason why I'm approaching this uh, topic of teenagers in Islam from this point of view is because the responsibility of the teenagers in Islam who are between the age of adolescence and adulthood. The word itself, teenager, to the best of my knowledge, is not a purely English word, and it means someone who is between the ages of 13 and 19 in the language that it comes from. This is a very difficult age. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, save yourselves and your family, from a fire to stool of men and stones, and over it there are angels that are severely and strong. We should look at this particular age, teenagers, the age that is between these two time periods. It's a very difficult age, and if we really want to uh, perfect the meaning of this ayah, save yourselves and your children, or your family, excuse me, then we need to look at specifically what is the makeup of this teenager? I think I'll be remiss also if I didn't mention what are the characteristics or what are the conditions of puberty? What are the conditions of El Bulul? What is El Bulul, which they translated into puberty? And I think this will help us in understanding what is this creature called a teenager? According to the scholars of Islam and of Sharia, there are four conditions for puberty. And you can take either a written or a mental note of this. Four conditions. If any one of those conditions comes into play, then that boy or girl has now reached al bulugh And they have now become respectfully balugh as a boy or baligha as a girl. Number one, any sign of pubic hairs or hairs under the armpits, under the arms. Any sign of pubic hairs or hair under the arms. If that boy or girl has that, they are now responsible, even if they're nine years old, to wear khimar, if they're a little girl, even though they may not have anything to put the khimar over. <laughs> and if they're a boy, if they're 10 years old, they now are responsible for salah and fasting in Ramadan. Number two, the, in, the emission of any seminal fluid on the part of the boy and or the girl. And incidentally, there are four conditions. Three of them are only for the boy and four for the girl. Any one of these comes, the person is in puberty. Number three is reaching the age of 15. Reaching the age of 15. The boy reaches the age of 15 and he didn't have any seminal fluid emitting from his private parts. Or if he reaches 15 and he didn't have any hair emi uh, coming out of his private parts or from under his arms, then he is violent. He is now responsible. He's reached puberty. And the last one, which only pertains to the girl, is, of course, al haib which is Muncie. If any one of these four comes, no matter how young they may be, and, of course, unless there's some uh, metaphysical or physiological impairment, then they have reached Balul, 
they have reached puberty. Now this age, brothers and sisters, it seems as though, the age called teenager, it seems as though many of us, those of us who are now adults, and we're still youth, according to Islam, those of us who are my age and older are still considered youth in Islam. I have to say my age up to about 50. I happen to be 41. We're still considered youth. Shabab, as they say in Arabic. This age, unfortunately, the teenage age, most adults seem like we've forgotten what it was to be like. All of a sudden, we put all these restrictions on our children as teenagers as though we have no frame of reference to what they're going through. For instance, when their hormones start calling their van. See, you understand what I mean. Their hormones start, Allah, 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 Allah. See, and they start looking at the young brothers and the young sisters. And you young brothers and young sisters, stop looking at those young brothers and those young sisters. We forget what happens between these two ages. And this age, in my humble opinion, is a very difficult age because they're, they're not close enough in age to being a real adult and they're quite a ways from being a little child anymore. It's real difficult. It's like being between uh, a tornado and a hurricane. You know, you, can't, you, you go this way and it pushes you that way, and then you go this way, you know, they, they, they don't know what's going on. Very difficult age. And it's a very important age because in the history of Islam, many, many of our Sahaba and Sahabiyat, male and female companions of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, did wonders at that age. Amazing things at that age. We have Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhuma, fighting battles at 14 years of age. 15. He was so small that he used to climb up on the enemy. He used to climb on the enemy. He had a little sword. He was chopping him with it. On it, the feet were off the ground. So young, but still fighting in battle. And Fatima and Aisha, radiallahu anha, especially Aisha, radiallahu anha, our mother, Ummul Mu'mineen, giving fatwa, fatawa, giving legal opinions and understanding from Quran on tafsir and fiqh at the age of 13. Adults coming to her, asking her questions about Allah, about Al-Akhirah, etc. But this age, brothers and sisters, is a very, very, very delicate age. I was at uh, a friend of mine's house the other day, and we were talking about marriage among the teenagers. And I told them that if I had a teenage daughter, and she wanted to get married, and she was absolutely sure that she wanted to get married, 16, 17, and the young brother was a good young brother. He's a nice young brother. That I would allow her to get married, and both of them could stay in my house until he was able to fully take care of her. This is very important for us to do. But instead, and you don't find this in our community, and I don't want to qualify what I mean by our community too much. You don't find it too much in our community, though we're being plagued by it, the same plague that some other Muslims have. We want our children, justifiably, I understand, we want the teenagers, no, you have to go to college. And like I said, their hormones are calling their van, and, you know, all types of things are happening to them that seemingly we have forgotten. All of a sudden now, you get 38 years old, you've forgotten what it's, to be, what it's like to be 17 or 16. So we say, no, you have to go to college. And then you put them in a, in a worse predicament, as they say in Arabic, the hasten basin in a very precarious situation. You don't want them to get married to young Abdullah, but you send them off to UCLA where the Kufar wolves are. And then you expect them to come back chasing modest. 
So we should ponder in these moments that we're talking here so that we can break to have some enjoyment in the, out of the food that's been prepared. We should be very careful about our understanding of the teenagers. And when Allah says, save yourselves and your family from a fire that's fueled with men and stones, according to the tafsir of Quran, it means to put them in the best possible Islamic environment. Secondly, firstly, give them the best Islamic education. We should be teaching the young brothers, those who are teenagers, that's the men, that is, we should be teaching them what it is to be a man. I encourage the brothers in this masjid and any masjid that listens to this faith after this to start a manhood training class in the masjid. So that the young brothers not only learn Quran, maybe Friday night you come to the masjid, you make the cast. You stay until Sunday. But those brothers who can pull themselves away from looking at the basketball game and doing whatever you do, spend some time with the young teenage brothers. Make the cast in the masjid. Read some ayat of Quran and discuss it. Read some authentic hadith of my beloved prophet and discuss them. Alayhi salatu salam. And then maybe take them out to teach them how to swim or karate or learn how to shoot. Because shooting is a strong sunnah in Islam. You should teach these young but No, I don't teach about guns. Yes. Teach them how to shoot. Whether it's a gun or archery. But teach them how to shoot. This is the statement from the Messenger of Allah instructing us to teach, learn to shoot, learn to shoot, learn to shoot. Teach them manhood skills. Teach them what it is to be a man so that then when they reach this fastly approaching, reaching this age, they'll be equipped. And this will also help us stay away from these bid'ah that some Muslims around the United States are practicing called rites of passage. Some Muslims are practicing what they call Islamic bar mitzvahs. No, set a time out of every week to teach the young brothers what it is to be a man. So that our young sisters, when they marry them, they will have good, solid husbands. As for the sisters, we should do similar acts. And you may not like it, but the most important act after learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the teenage sisters and learning about our deen, her deen, and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is to teach them to be good wives and good homemakers. No, it's no problem with being wanting to be a meteorologist sister. There's no problem in wanting to be a nurse or a doctor. There's no problem with this. But the first and foremost thing that the teenage sisters need to learn is how to be a good wife and mother. This is very important. And we've lost this. It has become unimportant to learn how to cook properly, to learn how to take care of the clothing. You don't, now you have sewing machines, alhamdulillah, you don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to do it with your hands. To learn how to take care of that man. This is not a condescending attitude. This is the purpose of why you were created after worshiping Allah. This is the purpose that one day you will grow up, figuratively speaking, you will grow up, because we're all growing in one sense or another, and you will marry. So those young sisters should be, there should be some preparation. And this is something that we have lost. I remember those of us, I'm sure those of us remember when we were pagans, mushrik cappers, we used to have a group called the MGT GCC. Muslim Girl Training General Civilization Class, where we used to train the sisters how to stand, how to walk, home economics. You even couldn't sit on a stool in the so-called Nation of Islam. I remember, I don't know if you remember, the sisters were told they couldn't even sit on a stool because it was unbecoming of a woman. This has some merit to it. There's some validity to this. How she should stand when she's waiting for a bus. I see some young sisters standing like this. You know, yeah, you know. This is not dignified for a young teenage sister to stand like this or to act like this. So these are important aspects in Islam for us to teach our teenage girls, young women, how to be good Muslim women and how to be good wives. 
one part of this, of saving yourselves and your family from this fire that's real and not symbolic, is to keep them away from those influences that are going to corrupt them and eventually send them to the Jahannam, the hellfire. One of them is to keep them away from these shows that you see on television. Some of these shows like Doogie Howser and The Good Times, The Wonder Years, whatever they call it, looking at Martin, having your teenagers, male and female, looking at Martin. What's up? What kind of stuff is that? What kind of stuff is that to be looking at? And you should start preparing them before they're teenagers not to look at, don't let them look at these cartoons. Have you noticed the way some of these, not some of the teenagers now, the ones who are before teenage age, eight and nine and ten, Yerhamakullah. Have you seen these cartoons now? The form and the shape of the female characters in the cartoons? Have you seen them? The breasts are sticking out, the hips are real shapely. Papa still ain't got married to Olive Oil yet. And I know Mickey ain't married to Minnie. Mickey Mouse, that is. Am I sweet? Y'all remember that? They shacking. Really, the lie. Look at the situation. They're shacking up. And we say, be a good boy, be a good girl, and go look at TV. So looking at TV is being good. Use the TV as a babysitter. And the commercials, the lie, the These commercials, these gene commercials. Subhanallah, some of these other commercials. Pure sex. And then when they become teenagers, they know more. We're talking about, Ya ayyuha ladheena amanu ku anfudakum ahlikum nara. Ahlikum nara. Save yourselves and your family from a fire. Brothers and sisters, when you look at some of these videos, I happened to be flipping the television one day and I saw this guy, Luke. You know what I'm talking about. This guy, Luke. They used to be with this group called Two Live Crew. I happened to be flipping the television one time. The Box. I don't know if you get it down here. It's called The Box Video. And I saw this video it's called I Want to Rock. SubhanAllah, haram, haram, haram. It's not funny. You should see what they were doing. Naked women were naked, as the Prophet Ali Salaam said, that in the end of this time, women will be cast, yet. Yeah, yeah. Or Cassius and Ariad, clothed but naked. I mean, shaking everything. And you allow your children free access to the remote control? SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. What are we teaching them? What are we allowing them to be educated by? Take a survey with the teenagers today. Ask them, who are the ten people that the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, promised, told they were going to Jannah? Some of their adults probably don't even know this let alone the teenagers. Ask the average teenage child in Islam today in the United States. Give me two of the people whom the Prophet named in that hadith are in Jannah. al ashrat mubashirun Those who were given the glad signs of Jannah. But I guarantee you, they can tell you what's the top ten hit with Kool Modi, Death of Fox, and Hammer. I guarantee you. Or who are the top ten heavyweight champions in the W? FC or World Wrestling Federation, whatever they call it. But they can't tell you who are ten prophets in order or out of order. And whose people did they go to? And what was the name of their revelation? Sad situation. And we're going to be responsible for these young men and women who are in an overwhelming rate, astronomical rate, are becoming pregnant. And incidentally, we shouldn't harp on the sisters keeping their virginity, brothers and parents. We shouldn't put so much pressure. And what I mean by that is we shouldn't harp on and badger and keep saying we want our girls to be virgins and, and neglect the boys. You should be encouraging these young boys to be virgins too. Not just the girls, the boys too. Virginity is for boys and girls, believe it or not. We should be very careful what the teenagers are getting in their minds. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he increases us with the zeal and the desire to get our children out of these ding-dong schools called public school systems. It's a very dangerous cesspool. These high schools are dangerous. 
and we expect them, and even not expect them, we reprimand them when they come home with these concepts. And you are the ones that sent them there. And here is a pagan woman. Here is a pagan woman named Clara Muhammad who refused to send her children to the public school when the FBI came to her house. She said, I'm not sending my children to you devils. A pagan woman. And here we are on the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sending our children to public school. I can't understand it. I can't understand it. She was closer to the sunnah than us. You know what's going on in these schools. Maybe not in Baltimore, but I know in Brooklyn, New York, just a few years ago, they confiscated 16 handguns, automatic weapons from elementary school children. Elementary school children, ages 9 and 10. Twelve year old boy the other day in Manhattan, one of the schools, T.S. something. Twelve years old, they took a Tech 9 from him. A tech, uh, this is not know, a tech nine, brother. You know what a tech nine is? SubhanAllah, 12 years old. And then now they have this wave of curriculum. And you expect your teenagers to come out with a kalbun salim, with a pure heart and a good character? We're going to be responsible. So in my conclusion, brothers and sisters, we should be more considerate to this age, the age of teenagers. We should try our best to make ourselves not seem like we're so over our teenage boys and girls. Speak to them, not down at them. Make them feel comfortable. I was invited by some young teenagers at uh, these Muslim Youth of North America conferences around the country and also in Canada to speak. In every single case, in every case, after the lecture, the young brothers and sisters, mainly the sisters, would come to me, teenagers, and want to talk to me because they said one thing. All of them said the same thing. They said, Brother Daoud, you seem like you're pretty down to earth, and we can't talk to our parents. Do you know how sad that is? We can't talk to our parents, so we'd rather talk to you. They don't understand us. They don't understand us. Why don't we understand them? We used to be them. As I said earlier, it seems like we've forgotten what it is to be a teenager. We need to let them be companions of us. You brothers that are teenage boys, young men, make them your sahabi. Take them out with you. Don't hang out with the brothers so much, and if you do, take your young brother, your young son with you. What's wrong with that? How do you think Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Omar ibn al-Khattab's son, Abdullah, and the other young Muslims of that time learned so much about Islam. You think they learned about it by staying at home? They learned about it by close association to the adults and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a clear indication on how, what type of attitude and comportment we should have with the teenagers. And the same thing should go with the young sisters. You should be skillful enough, sisters, to have a relationship with your daughter that you are her mother, but at the same time you her friend. She should be able to confide in you and come to you with her problem and you not look down at her or yell at her or scream at her when just a few days ago you were her. You should also, my suggestion, not commanding you as advice, allow the teenagers to put on events like this one. Let them run the camera. Let them pay for the speaker to come here. Let them take care of the food. Let them run the whole thing. Train them how to run it. Teach the young brothers how to do a khutbah when they reach 13 or 14 or 15. These are important things for leadership in Islam. It starts with the teenagers. You sit back a little while now. I see most of the times in the messages, the sisters who are cooking are always the adults. Get those young teenage sisters and keep them from standing out in the hallways and, and sitting on the chairs talking about these young boys that you don't think they're talking about. And get them some jobs. Let them run the whole show. This speech I did in Winnipeg, Canada. The teenagers there, 
13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 years old, paying for my plane fare out of their own money, paying for my health care out of their own money, they dealt with the camera, the whole camera equipment, the audio equipment, they cooked the food, did the whole transportation bit for me throughout the city of Manitoba, or Winnipeg. Not one adult was involved. Not one. Five days I spoke. Five full days. Over 85 hours of sleep. And it was all done by the teenagers. So in my conclusion, brothers and sisters, please remember this age called teenagers. Please remember it. Those whose values have changed, Shaitan has not. Those some of the mores have changed, Shaitan has not. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember that our open enemy is Shaitan. And remember this delicate age between 13 and 19. Try your best with all of your level best to train them as much as you can the Islamic values. Allow them and support them in getting married if they're ready. Don't tell them you're not ready. In most cases, you do know they're not ready. I'm telling you, young brothers, in most cases, you're not ready. But talk to them at least about it. And encourage them to get a good education in Islam first. And even if you do send them to college, which I believe is Haram to send them away, especially the sisters, not the brothers, but the sisters, I believe personally, it's Haram, based on my understanding of Quran and Sunnah, to send your daughter away to college. And if you do allow them to go to college locally, make sure that they have a good foundation of the understanding of Islam before you go, because well, why they will be corrupt when they come out. They may not even the sophomore year, and they'll be corrupt with these humanistic thoughts, these Machiavellian concepts, these concepts from Freud, etc. So with that, inshallah, we'll end for questions and answers, and uh, hopefully Allah will increase our love for him and increase our love and zeal to follow the Prophet and treat our teenagers the way they should be treated as young men and women, not babies. The first question is, is it, is it vain for teenage Muslim sisters to talk vain in the masjid? If you mean vain conversation, it is at least makru, highly undesirable for anyone, adult or teenage, to talk vain conversation in the masjid. The masjids are the houses of Allah, and we should not be talking about anything in the masjid. We should be talking about the remembrance of Allah, and we should be remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah knows that. This is the only one that was brought up. Write it down, uh, and then we could we can get it up. Uh, give it to Brother Mustafa Leaf, and he could bring it up right away. Uh, for the brothers, if you have a question, just raise your hand, and we could deal with that one right away. Uh, any of the brothers? Uh, yes, sir. The different kind of hairstyle the brothers have. What is it said about that? The phase that brothers have and the different uh, dreadlocks and stuff like that. I don't know directly related to teenagers in Islam because it doesn't have the teenagers do it. Sometimes it's the adults doing it. But uh, to answer the question, to the best of my ability, the phase haircut would be at least, my course, at least. If it's completely shaven with his hair, on the top or on the side, vice versa, and no hair on the top, vice versa, on the, on the bottom, then it would be at least Maku or Haram, I can say, because this is called Kaba. Kaba, when the Prophet of Islam saw a young man like this, he said to him, let him either cut it all off, shave it all off, or let it all grow. So the third step would be at least Maku. From that point, and also the second point, it would be Maku 
He says it's an imitation of the Kufar. It's Tashabbuh. And the Prophet says in the Hadith, in the short version, in the Sunan of Abi Dawood, and in the long version of the Musnad ibn Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and both narrations are authentic, the longer version in Ahmad, the short version in, in the Sunan of Abi Dawood, he says, Man tashabbaha bi qawmin fahuwa mizhum. Whoever imitates the people, he is of them. As for the dreadlocks, the dreadlocks are haram. No doubt. Because it is not a cultural hairdo, it is the hairdo with religious origin. It is the hairdo worn by the people who either A, worship Haile Selassie, or B, worship Thunder. There are people, a tribe in Nigeria, who worship Thunder, and this is their hairstyle. Secondly, especially for the women, if you want to make whistles, the whistles for the women varies to two categories. The whistle for the women for Janaba, for sexual intercourse, is different from the whistle of the women for Haid, Mishis. The whistle for the women for Haid, she has to unbraid her hair. She has to unbraid her hair. And for Janaba, sexual intercourse, or wet dreams, she doesn't have to. This is authenticated in authentic hadith by our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. With the dreadlocks, which are in... Maybe they're not even braids at all. If for her to accomplish this, she would have to crush them from the root. And thirdly, please, is an imitation of the kufar. It's not connected to our African culture. It's just Very good. Very 
good. And uh, the brother is mentioning that um, a lot of the teenagers don't know, and I'll add to that that a lot of adults don't know, that their cousins, and in the Western Hemisphere, we say first cousin, second cousin, third cousin, fourth cousin. Doesn't mean anything in Islam, so cousins are cousins. They don't know that their cousins are haram for them. You cannot, brothers and sisters, kiss and hug your cousins. I know it will make them sad. I know it will make them sad. But they are haram for you. Why? Because you can marry your cousins, whether they're the first, second, or third cousins. You cannot kiss and hug and be in private company with your cousins. That also goes for the adults. Hijab or no hijab, whether they're Muslim cousins or non-Muslim cousins, doesn't make any difference. We have to prepare ourselves and prepare our families. When we go to these family reunions, you should tell them up front or send a notice to them before you go to South Carolina, look, I'm a Muslim. I'm a Muslim. Tell them to send them a letter. I, I, I can't wait to get to the family reunion to keep this bond, this family tie. But I'm telling you, Aunt Mabel, up front, that I'm a Muslim now and I can't kiss you. Not Aunt Mabel, excuse me, your, your, your daughter or your son. Because my cousins are not allowed to, to be in close proximity with me because we can marry our cousins. It may sound uh, reprehensible to your relatives who are non-Muslims, but that's the way it is, and we must tell them the truth. Well, I tell this al-haq of al-baat, well, I tell them al-haq, wa antum ta'lamun. As Allah says in the Quran, do not mix the truth with falsehood, nor hide it while you know. As a young Muslim sister, we are to dress modest. Can we wear clothes we get from the mall and want to dress modest and still look good? What do you suggest? First of all, if you reach the age of puberty, you have to dress like your mother. And you mothers, you have to dress like the Sahabiyat of the Messenger of Allah. You hear what I said? You see, because if I would have just left it with you young sisters had to dress like your mothers, you would be jammed because some of the mothers don't dress right. I've seen some young sisters wearing neckties with a khimar. This is haram. Haram! The Messenger of Allah, the Lord of Allah, told us, Allah and the angels curse the men who imitate women and the women who imitate men. If you allow your teenage girl to wear a necktie, you are going to reap part of the sin. It's haram. So how much more her walking outside with her neck exposed and her earrings dangling, her arms out, and a shirt on that goes below her buttocks, but still it's a shirt that shows the size of her breast. You brothers and sisters, you're going to be held responsible for letting your daughters go out like this. <clears throat> Where do you get your sources from about unbraiding your hair for ghusl? If you want to see me after this lecture, I'll give you the hadith. In Arabic and in English, or I'll translate it for you, inshallah. I get my sources from the Quran and the authentic sunnah of our beloved Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where you also should take yours from. Is it proper to tabligh a male for you to marry him? No. The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa is it proper for you to tabligh? We say, we say uh, tabligh. That's how Americans say it. The word is tabligh. From balagha, you balighu, tablighan. It's to invite or convey, invite people, give them da'wah. That's what it means. Is it permissible or proper to tabligh a male for you to marry him? No. It is not. What's your evidence, Brother Daoud? The evidence is an Amir al-Mu'mineen Abi Hassan. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu qal sami'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul innama al-a'malu bin-niyyat wa innama likum lim'in ma nawa fa man kanat hijratuhu ila Allah wa rasulihi fa hijratuhu ila Allah wa rasulihi fa man kanat hijratuhu li yusib al-dunya li yusibuha aw imra'atun yankihuha fa hajr fa man kana hajra ilayhi the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Actions are judged by intention, and man will get that which is intended. Whoever's hijra 
is for Allah, whoever is uh, Hijra is for Allah and his messenger, then his Hijra is for Allah and his messenger. Whoever is Hijra is for to acquire some worldly gain or to marry some woman, and in this case to marry some man, then his Hijra is for that. You should be inviting this man through your brother or imam or uncle or whoever, not directly, to come to La ilaha illallah, not to marry him. And only that. <clears throat> and let me tell you something else, sisters. If he knows that's the reason why you're doing it, you're going to be in big trouble when you marry him. If you know anything about the nature of men, if he knows that you are talking to him just to marry him, when you marry him and he takes shahada, or when, you, when he takes shahada and then you marry him, because you can't do it the other way around, you're going to have a big problem. Wallahu a'lam. Wallahu you're going to have a big problem. Especially once he, once he learns about Islam. Because he will see now that he had married an ignorant woman. What woman in their right mind wants to talk to a man just to get him to accept Islam just so she can marry him? You should be warning him to accept Islam whether you marry him or not. So that he can go to Jannah. October of 1992, a Muslim village was raided. Brothers and sisters were physically searched and rights violated. The reason for the raid was a tax evasion. Not tax, tax, it's a tax invasion. Tax evasion. Could you please comment on the harsh and unwarranted actions taken against Muslims here and abroad? This incident took place in Colorado. Yes, I was shown this, a photocopy of this yesterday. It's not directly related to teenagers in Islam, but it's related to our problems and dilemma in Islam in general. And the only comment that I can say about this is that at the very least we should make dua for them and at the very most we should stand up and do something about it. I mean, what else is there to say? With our time, with our money, our efforts, or with our lives, we should do something about it. There's, you don't need a scholar or a rocket scientist to get the answer to this. If one part of the body hurts, the whole body feels the fever and the pain of it. Is that it, brothers and sisters? Yes. Yes. That you have? I would say that I will put it another way. Jazakallah kula khairan. May Allah reward you with good in all of us. I mean, I would say that you should have dua in the beginning of your effort and dua at the end. And in between, you should have some effort. Is that a little bit better? You're welcome. It's two more and then we'll end it, inshallah. If your mother breastfeeds another child, isn't it true that you cannot marry them and therefore can be treated like a brother, including your, ma your male cousins? Yes and no. If your mother breastfeeds everybody on this block, number one, you should keep a record of it. You know, the Muslims of the United States are in need of, a, of an Islamic Bureau of Vital Statistics. So something that we should keep record of who breastfed who, who married who, who divorced who, who went to jail. We should keep these things. Who beats his wife, send a picture, fax a copy. Every man should have a fax machine. Take a picture of that, brother. A before and after picture. You know what I mean, brother? A before, a before and after picture. Fax it to all the masters in the United States. So when he tries to go through that stuff again, another master, we can check him. But as far as breastfeeding, Yes, she is now, or he is now haram for you. But no. You can go in the room with her brother. They are now brothers and sisters. It has to be five. And it used to be ten, but it was abrogated. And now it's five. Is it haram for a virgin sister to marry a man who is not a virgin but is Muslim? Absolutely not. What is my proof? The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, married Aisha. She was a virgin. He was married. That's the proof. 
Can you please elaborate on the wrongness of telling our children to marry after they complete their college education? I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying that you fulfill your needs. Why are you going to prevent them from fulfilling theirs? Why is it all of a sudden you want them to go to college, which is good to do, but marriages have to be? What is it that you have in your mind? Is it because you didn't complete and you want to fulfill your aspirations through them? Is that what it really is? Is that your need yet? Or do you want her to become a great doctor, which won't help her in the akhirah? Or do you want her to be a good Muslim woman and wife, which will help her get to the akhirah? Because for surely, if a man dies being, being pleased with his wife, she will go to paradise. If he dies being pleased with her, I know all the time when my, I get angry with my wife and she, I'm going out the door or something, she, she comes to her senses and runs to the door and stops me. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want you to get hit by a car and die. Like, cause, you know, if you, if, you, if you die and you're displeased with her, she's going to hell. But, I mean, good valid reasons. This authentic hadith. One of your tickets to dinner is through your husband. So why are you going to prevent your teenage daughter from getting married and send her off to college where she may commit a haram? Who well, I know this. I mean, she can commit a haram right here in the high school. But you are sending to her to a situation where she is going to see things that she's probably never seen before. She's going to see men, young men, good-looking young men, fast-talking, slick-talking, glow-in-the-dark guys, who's going to be rapping to her and saying things that's going to make her head spin, and you're going to wonder why she came back pregnant or got rid of it and you didn't even know it. <clears throat> May Allah forgive us of our sins, and please, sisters and brothers and sisters, please, protect these teenagers. They're our future. They are our future. And I can't emphasize enough how important the teenagers are in this land. Very serious age. Very serious age. Take more time with them. Talk to them. Don't talk at them and down, the, down at them. Talk to them. Hang out with the young, young son, brothers. Hang out with them. Okay. We have uh, three more questions that we're going to hold until after the Salah, inshallah. I pray Allah that he guides all of us and that we pray our prayer for the Maghrib as though it is our last. Subhanahu wa ta'ala wa ashadu an la ilaha ila anta wahdaka la shurika lak, astaghfiruk wa asubu ilayki.